Wednesday. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our Texan webinar with the title Transfer Pricing in Troubled Waters, Perspectives from Around the Globe. Um, in the next 60 minutes, we would like to share with you global insights as regard the um, COVID-19 pandemic, which um, has um, hit hard the global economy. And what, what we would like to discuss here is um, the consequences and, uh, of, for determination and documentation of this pandemic for um, transfer prices um, in multinational companies. My name is Arsten Quidditch. I'm associated partner with Bicoke Schaumburg in Germany. And I've got here, at least virtually, my dear colleagues from the Texan network, Mark Arms from the US, um, based in New York. Um, Dong Hong Lee, based in South Korea, and Stefano Bognandi from LED Texan, um, in, based in Italy. Um, together, we've picked four cases, which you can see on the agenda, and um, those cases we, will, um, we would like to discuss in the next 60 minutes, um, let's say, in the format of a, of a panel discussion. So if we met Virtumat physically, we would stand all in front of you and provide you um, four different country perspectives from, and I'm proud to say that, three different countries. Um, so as you can see from the agenda, we, we will to discuss um, intercompany relationships. We'll keep going with database studies. Um, then um, we'll discuss on intangible and, and, and intangible assets and finalize the webinar with a discussion on um, financial transactions. Before we start with the first, just two general notes. Um, first of all, um, you will receive copies of the slide deck afterwards via email, and also the webinar will be recorded, and you'll um, receive an internet link um, via the same email um, afterwards. So you don't have to take notes, just um, listen. Um, to us, and if you want to ask questions, and that's my uh, last remark, you've got the option here in the program, and as far as possible, and um, if time allows, we will, of course, um, try to answer those questions within the webcast presentation, and if not, um, we'll, of course, get back to them after the webinar. Okay, then I think we'll start with the first case, um, which um, you can see on the present slide. We've got a uh, group which is active in the production of household and kitchen appliances. And this group has installed a so-called um, principal structure for its global business activities. Um, we've got Alpha, which uh, shall be the parent company based in Germany, which has a function of the so-called entrepreneur. That means, in particular, it has all the necessary IP that is necessary for uh, the manufacturing and distribution of the products worldwide at its disposal. There's two subsidiaries, Beta and Gamma. Beta is a, a contract manufacturer um, that produces the product and is remunerated on the basis of a cost plus approach. And the products so um, produced are then um, distributed worldwide via um, foreign based companies. Um, in the chart, you can see it's Gamma. It uh, distributes the products on its own account and in its own name. And the activities are remunerated um, based on the transactional net margin um, method. And um, let's assume the COVID-19 pandemic hit the business of this group hard and led to a drop in sales, and in the end, to losses. The question arises how we can allocate those profits or... Mark, maybe I can hand over to you because there's a technical problem in the room I'm sitting, which I have to deal with. So um, please go ahead and provide us with the US perspective. Yeah, no problem, Kostin. Uh Part of the fun, I suppose, of course, as we are all seeing about uh, dealing with the virtual world now. As Karsten said, of course, we would love to be uh, in front of you directly and uh, in going through some of the presentation and some of the ideas, but hopefully uh, the next best solution. Uh, you know, in, in thinking about this fact pattern, uh, you know, I think that the classic transfer pricing answer to me first comes to, to mind, which is it depends. 
Uh, you know, I think there are always many options for, you know, how this could be viewed, depending on the countries involved, depending on the attitude of, uh, you know, of the tax authorities, the, the approaches there. Uh, you know, and I think one of the interesting things, of course, about COVID is the way that it has impacted economies, very different from any other thing that we have seen from, from other downturns. Uh, you know, none of us in this, in the current generations have ever experienced something of this sort. Even the global financial crisis presented different uh, circumstances and different challenges. So it, it presents uh, some really unique challenges, I think, for transfer pricing. I think one thing also that you will continue to hear throughout uh, the presentation today is references back to the agreements. You know, and I think, of course, uh, again, here also, right, in times of, uh, of challenge, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and change, this is when we all come back to the agreements and think about how important the intercompany agreements actually are. And in this kind of case, I think it is quite important, right, to be able to look into you know, do we have some flexibility already built into the agreements themselves between the relationships uh, with the contract manufacturer and with the distributors? Uh, you know, looking for some, uh, if you will, some flexibility about how we can transact with one another. I think the other thing that will certainly be very important is documenting, you know, the exact fact pattern that's giving rise to the losses. Uh, again, one of the interesting things about COVID is it hits countries at different times. So there has not been a, you know, necessarily one exact period where it impacted the entire globe at the exact same moment. So there are some differences for each business then also in how this is being impacted. And so thinking about, you know, what, what decisions are at the local management level, for instance, perhaps the local distributor says no. You know, look, we are not impacted by COVID right now, so continue to send me product. We still have demand. I am confident that we can sell this. Uh, you know, where maybe central management is wanting to be a little more careful, and then we come to see that perhaps the distributor is not able to actually sell everything there. So in this case, is a limited risk distributor entitled to the same protections that it might otherwise be? You know, again, I think there are some some debates there. Uh, same on a contract manufacturer side, right? Perhaps there are some steps being taken to keep people employed, keep people active and utilized uh, just for the benefit of the factory line, you know, and perhaps it's local decisions about this. Uh, so I think you have to consider all of the facts and circumstances as we always do in transfer pricing and consider how these maybe get impacted then, particularly by COVID. So, you know, Stefano, you know, maybe thinking about it more from the, the Italian perspective again, where I think it, it also perhaps becomes a little bit more formalistic sometimes. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, well, for Italy, I think a couple of preliminary remarks would be worth doing. First of all, that, uh, uh, um, and this would be valid throughout the, 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 the webinar for all, all the topics that we are dealing with, uh, we, we have no specific uh, uh, guidelines for each topic, so basically we, we have a law endorsing the OECD guidelines, but we do not have specific indications. So reference, uh, uh, I will make reference to the cluster pricing guidelines throughout the conference. Second, as probably most of the countries all over the world, what you may expect, you may expect from the tax authorities when reviewing your decisions to take diverging approach uh, depending on whether the, li the, the limited risk entity is, look, is a resident in Italy, for example, or is a foreign associate of an Italian part. So this is, I think, uh, quite common. Then going to the, to the question, I think a uh, couple of observations. First of all, when we talk about limited risk entities, we do not mean no risk entities. So certain, certain level of risks are present in those entities. Think about distributors may have price risks, inventory risk. They have a credit risk for sure. So losses deriving from, from those risks should be, of course, allocated to those, to those entities as long as they have the 
key management decisions to take care and to take control over those functions. Same applies, in my view, to, uh, for example, inventory risk for manufacturer, for example. Second consideration, I think it's important to give a, a, a thought consideration of, 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 of uh, why losses have, have arisen. So, for example, if, you, if we think about the contract manufacturer who, who has suffered a low utilization capacity, uh, this could depend uh, the reason why this happened. I mean, it can be that uh, we have a manufacturer responsible for, for procurement function, for example, and uh, due to a disruption in its supply chain, this manufacturer was unable to, uh, to deliver its products. On the contrary, we, have also, we may also have a different situation where a, where a principal, because of a lack of demand, uh, for example, uh, its retailers are closed for the lockdown, uh, this principle might, might, might have reduced his, his, his purchase orders. So basically, uh, the, the causes for the loss is also an important uh, driver for your decision, in my view, on who should bear the risk and who should bear the loss. Then, uh, really quickly going through the uh, uh, contract, uh, I mean, how you can deal with that. Uh, in my view, uh, you should first look, of course, at your contractual provisions, contracts that are existing, but you should also think that contracts usually may also be changed when there is a mutual agreement from the parties, and uh, also depending on what are the options available to the parties, depending on the specific economic circumstance. And finally, taking into account what unrelated parties would have reacted, how they have, would have reacted to this situation. So, for example, it, it's not uncommon in these days to see unrelated parties to provide financial assistance to their counterparty with a view to preserving their own business. Uh, and, and in my view, this approach is also consistent with what the transfer pricing guidelines says uh, about uh, the, 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 the temporary losses. You may think about paragraph D3 in the, in the transfer pricing guidelines, for example. So, um, having said that, I would uh, leave the word to Dan Kuhn. Okay. Um, in this case, ARPA is an entrepreneur, and Beta and Gamma are limited risk entities in Korea. Most taxpayers must report their transfer pricing policy to the Korean tax authority through a local file or other corporate tax filing form. Once Alpha is declared as entrepreneur and Beta and Gamma are reported as limited risk entities and as tested parties, Beta and Gamma must be guaranteed certain arms length profits as defined by the transfer pricing policy and Alpha must bear the losses due to the economic downturn we are talking about. Um, right now, we are assuming overall recession under the COVID-19 pandemic, but on the contrary, we should consider the explosive growth situation. Entrepreneur does not share its excess returns with its limited risk entities, even if there are enormous excess profits during such growth. If the limited risk entity assumes the burden of losses under the COVID-19, the excess profit in the economic boom should also be shared. Such transfer pricing policy should be regarded as profit sharing methods. And can no longer be regarded as PNNM or cost plus method we are talking on this case. Of course, it is possible to operate the margins of limited risk entities at the lower quartile level within the arms length price range because, as you know, the arms length price is usually estimated as an interquartile range rather than a single price. Okay. I, I think it's better to move on to the second case. Um, and, I mean, the German perspective is basically 
um, the same as the one my fellow speakers have um, um, presented on. Of course, uh, the, the routing companies are guaranteed uh, a small but stable profit, but in my view, um, given the extraordinary um, circumstances under the COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, I, I would think it should be possible to um, allocate um, some part of um, the losses to, to the routine companies, at least for a very, very limited of, uh, period of time. But of course, as Mark said, um, documentation will be key um, to provide the reasons. And, and of course, the reasons must be um, the, the pandemic itself. And, and if, if you have companies that were um, in the losses um, ahead of the crisis, um, you'll have prob probably have problems to defend um, such a TP strategy in the future. Um, but um, of, of course, it's it's definitely um, worth um, taking a, a, a reduction of the profit markup, or even um, just covering part of the costs into account. Um, maybe even cost minus, but that's that's all. As Mark said, it's it all depends on the circumstances of the individual case. Okay, shall we move on to? Um, the next case. Yeah, I think that sounds good, Karsten, and I think it actually uh, ties in together as well. So next, what we wanted to to briefly explore is you know the, the idea of, of how we're going to treat the actual benchmark analyses, right? Uh, benchmark analysis within our databases. This is one of the fundamental parts of any kind of you know transfer pricing these days. Uh, Typically, right, so many cases are falling under a TNMM type of a uh, methodology. Even if it's a residual profit split, we still must first do some benchmarking around the routine returns to arrive at the residual. So the benchmark, of course, is a central part of any analysis. But how do we do this when we are confronted with the likelihood, at least, and this is part of the challenge, but the likelihood that 2020 might see some really significant losses uh, also amongst the comparable benchmarks. So if we think about this from our typical transfer pricing, if we are doing a planning or even documentation, how do we best treat this? So the, the brief you know, scenario here outlines you know, a company that has actually started a new operation in 2020 uh, quite ambitious to be starting uh, some new operations, perhaps, in the midst of COVID, uh, and then no less even starting that uh, contract manufacturer, it's starting this operation in the UK. So we also have a Brexit uh, sort of uh, you know, transition uh, also at play. So a variety of things may be happening here. A very ambitious company, but uh, business must go on. So when we think about how to establish the prices for a company like this, right? If we rely on our typical, you know, maybe looking three years or even five years, some form of recent historical average, one, it will certainly be very different from the actual experience of 2020. It may also be still quite different from 2021. And as we know, we won't actually see the results of comparable company results though coming through the databases and whatnot for a, for a period of time now, right? Oftentimes in particular, say for European comparable, we may not see the results for, you know, call it sort of 18 months or so uh, later. So there's a, a bit of a lag. So how do we best account for this? Uh, and I think this is going to be one of the, the very interesting things, right, going forward also from a tax audit perspective, and you know, how did companies reasonably arrive uh, at the, the prices that they set in the first place, so that as we were talking about earlier, if we have target margins, you know, were those target margins, especially now newly, were those established on a reasonable basis, on an arm's length basis, given the economic environment? Uh, you know, is there some need for, for adjustment up or down? So I, I think we are left with, uh, again, with some, some very interesting scenarios about how to, to treat this. I know for our part, you know, here in the US, we did try to look back to, for instance, the experience in the global financial crisis. Amongst US companies, US comparables, we actually found that there was not a significant drop-off 
in the ranges that we would see for typical sort of LRD or limited risk service provider type functions, the margins actually remained pretty consistent throughout uh, the GFC period. And again, I think that's just because it was a very different type of a crisis perhaps than what we are seeing now. So we, again, we don't really have a good example to say, you know, hey, let's look back to that period, at least for US comparables. Let's look back to that historical period and make a similar adjustment to, get to the last crisis. So I think we have to you know, get a little bit more creative perhaps about how we think about the benchmarks. I also think it's going to be important to consider for the individual countries whether it's a single year testing period or multiple year testing period, right? Many countries do allow for the multiple year, but not everywhere. In some places it is still the individual years and the actual annual results that are quite important. Uh, you know, so I, I think we'll need to, to be thinking about all of these things as we conduct benchmark studies, whether for planning or for documentation purposes going forward. So, you know, Dong Hoon, you know, thinking about you know Korea and, and again, you know, it sounds like Korea is a bit more strict, generally speaking, about the application of the transfer pricing methods, you know, locally. What do you think there the view might be about how to treat the uh, Thank you, Mark, for your input from U.S. perspective. I want to add some comments on from Korean perspective. Um, first of all, in terms of calculating the arms length price for planning purposes to be applied after 2020, in this case, 8% of profit markup calculated by the three-year average from 2017 to 2019, of course, cannot be an appropriate result to be applied to beta. Not only beta, but also selected comparable companies will see significant changes in profitability after the book closing of 2020. But the problem is that the level of the impact cannot be determined at the moment. So one possible and most simplified solution might be to use database benchmarking to see how much the profit margin fell compared to the previous one when the past 2008 global financial crisis came. For example, through a public database, it is possible to figure out the extent to which comparable companies' profitability deteriorated in 2008 compared to 2007 before the global financial crisis. It can be used in terms of transfer pricing planning in 2020 by quantifying and reflecting the degree of, degree of the decline in profitability before and after the 2008 global financial crisis. Of course, as Mark mentioned, the quantification of, of the effects of the economic crisis and adjustment of differences should be approached by case-by-case -case basis for each industry and for each clients. Let's hear about the uh, Italian perspective from Stefano. Yes, uh, we'll try to be quite, quite uh, short in order also in the, in the interest of time. I would say, first of all, that of course the, the, the prior period of 2017-2019 would not be really useful. Uh, um, we believe, uh, even if it's, if it's not written in the stone, that using a single year data could be accepted. We know that even if the tax authorities in Italy are not used to accept uh, uh, comparables in a loss-making position, uh, we also know that there has been a lot of uh, um, court cases where uh, this pos possibility has been allowed by the courts. Um, I think that basically, really in brief, uh, the, here we have an issue, uh, different issues for, for price setting and price checking. Uh, purposes. For price checking purposes in Italy you have to prepare TV documentation by the end of 2021. So hopefully there will be uh, comparables for the 2020 period and you should know that in this case for example a contract manufacturer working in Italy should be benchmarked according to Italian tax authority based on Italian comparables. So comparable data for 2020 should be available. Um, for price, uh, price setting purposes, so how to deal with it uh, today, Th this is more tricky. 
my idea is that uh, one one uh, one one group may may deal with that by probably trying to analyze its own DNF, trying to analyze what are the causes of the of the losses, and maybe identify what are the losses that can be attributed to the crisis. For example, by comparing its budget and its actual data, or at least its, its initial budget and its revised budget assumption, and for example, take into account increased discount policies, inventory write-off, bad debts, uh, restructuring the cost. Uh, also, for example, one may, may want to consider the, the, the increase of the fixed cost uh, as a percentage of sales due to, due to the uh, increase of idle capacity. So, by using these this, this, uh, uh, tools, one may be, uh, it may be possible to, to, to at, at least set a level of remuneration that uh, one may want to defend the next year when uh, the, the possibility to have a benchmark perform will be available. Thanks, Stefano. But as, as you guys said, I think it's, of course, we cannot rely on comparable years 15 to 19 as, let's say, competition and, and market conditions were much more favorable uh, than, than it is today. So the question is, um, what can we do and what could be um, a reliable um, comparable? That's, of course, as you said, Stefano, that's a tricky question. And I think the best from what I can see now, the best estimation would be to refer to the global financial crisis in 2008 and see um, what the margins were like during this crisis and afterwards. And I, I, I think we could, of course, include loss-making companies in, in, in the pool of comparables, but it may be important to, let's say, have companies that are in a temporary loss situation and not companies that have been making losses for the last 30 years. Um, that would probably be rejected by the German tax authorities. But um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky question, but I think it may be, it does make sense to look at, um, at the years back um, in 2008 and 2009. Um, but of course, it's interesting, as you said, Mark, that in the U.S. It, it, margins didn't really drop. So um, in this case, um, yeah, we would look for another approach. Yeah, we, we were actually a bit disappointed to see that uh, we could not maybe have more useful data coming out of the financial crisis. We were hoping to find a bit more of a drop-off when we were doing uh, some of this analysis. Yeah, just to, to add, you know, one thing that we have also been trying to do in certain uh, situations is looking to quarterly results as companies, you know, particularly public companies, as they release quarterly financials, looking to see that and looking that for me for some guidance at least on what the full year might look like and trying to, uh, you know, incorporate that into some of the analysis. Again, it's, you know, not perfect and it's still too early in the year to have much of a, of a sample size. We'll need to wait until at least you know, the end of the current uh, June 30 quarter when financials come out, but uh, another option. Shall we um, move on to discussion around uh, licensing intangibles? Okay. Um, so the case is about the intangible assets, especially about the royalty transactions. Um, our part in here is based in Korea and is active in R&D, manufacturing, and distribution of auto parts products. It is the owner of IP of manufacturing. And ARPA has concluded a license agreement with its subsidiary Beta located in China, which runs until 2022. In the license agreement, ARPA grants Beta the exclusive right to manufacture all parts products using the IP of ARPA and to distribute them in China. A tech license of 4% was agreed and due to the low situation under COVID-19. And Beta, as a result of the crisis, and ARPA and Beta agreed at the end of May 2020 to charge only a rising fee of 2% from 1st July 2020. Taking into account the lower license fee, ARPA will generate a loss 
in 2020. So here we have two questions. Can losses of the licensee here better justify a suspension of the license payment? And second question is, does an additional contract adjustment make sense in this case? So let me first introduce my comments from Korean perspective. Um, well, in Korea, there is a tax tribunal precedent that is highly relevant to this case. According to the precedent, it is the position of the Korean tax authorities that the suspension of a royalty fee is acceptable in case of licensee's loss-making status. If the provision of the loyalty payment suspension are included in the royalty contract in advance. Uh, to, ex to explain a bit more, Korean tax authorities position is that the situation in which the licensee records losses might be interpreted as uh, there is a, no benefit from the intangible asset. Um, therefore, in a situation where there is no benefit it is reasonable to postpone the royalty fee payment and pay the royalties when the licensee enjoys the benefit from the intangible asset in the future, uh, that is, in the event of profit making. However, according to the precedent, such payment suspension provisions must be specified in advance in the work contract. Uh, therefore, many Korean m and multinational companies often include this before the royalty payment clause when signing a royalty contract with overseas affiliates. And many transfer pricing experts also recommend clients to include this default payment clause in their contract. Uh, one important thing is the payment of the royalty fee is just deferred and not be exempt. So the period, the period of the royalty contract is prolonged by the year in which it is deferred. Um, this kind of payment suspension provision can be a useful tip for royalty contracts between affiliates in the context of the current COVID-19 crisis. Okay, let's hear about the uh, Italian perspective from Stefano. Thank you, Dan Vu. Uh, well, I said, as I said again, we have no specific guidelines and no, not really specific uh, case law in this respect. I would, what I would say is that as a matter of principle, license fee uh, is always linked to the profitability of the underlying IP. And uh, having said that, uh, the fact that uh, this IP cannot generate uh, huge returns or the usual returns uh, due to the, to the crisis, this could be a good reason for uh, changing, uh, eventually changing the agreement. And uh, again, it would be the interest of both parties to do that. And of course, this change should be formalized in a, in a written form. Uh, in order to quantify the, 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 the change in the royalty, what I would think about is that, of course, we, do not, we would not have comparable data to look at for 2020. But at least for royalty payments, we have the possibility to use, for example, a profit split. And profit split may be useful to set a, 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 a revised royalty rates. I think if Beta was located in Germany, the German tax authorities would, of course, um, expect a reduction in the license um, rate um, in this situation. I think it's, it's more interesting if you turn this, this case upside down and, and um, assume that the licensor was, was based in Germany, then we, we've often seen the tax authorities to expect, of course, or to accept a reduction in the license fee, but at the same time expect um, the inclusion of a, of a provision in the, in the license agreement that provides for an increase of the license fee once the, the profitability of, of the licensee swings back up to a certain level of profit and, and therefore in, in, in the total period of time allows the, the German licensor to, to earn a profit, uh, to earn a license fee that, that is at the level of the, the fee that was initially uh, agreed upon.
Mark, do you do you want anything to add I from the U.S. Briefly, perspective? I, mean, I think it's largely consistent what what you all have said. You know, again, I think in particular when it comes to intangibles, I think the agreement is very important. Uh, you know, my experience, at least on audit and in APA or MAP scenarios, is that agreements tend to carry even more weight in a license arrangement uh, than they do in a sort of standard distribution scenario. Uh, you know, I think IP always gets a little bit of a different treatment. Uh, you know, so I think making sure you know that it is possible to adjust the license fees is is one key item. Also, evaluating you know if there's other things that are maybe leading to those losses. Other, you know, for instance, again, is there something locally being done that's increasing the costs that's really leading to the losses, as opposed to the inability to make use or benefit from the license technology. And so I think you have to anticipate, you know, challenges from the tax authorities there to, you know, to sort of consider, you know, hey, is there really something else that's driving it? Um, but, you know, and then the other thing, of course, is, you know, as you've mentioned, keeping it as a temporary matter, right? I, I think we would be more successful in this. We've mentioned it many times now today, right, where it would be arm's length behavior to expect some type of concession from a counterparty in such unusual times. We see it all the time happening, you know, with maybe rent abatement, uh, different thing, you know, extensions of credit. So I think you do see uh, arrangements like this happening in the real world, and I think on intercompany basis that we would also expect to see, uh, you know, some experience of working together to continue the relationship. And it's just finding, you know, documenting that in a proper way and saying that the solution we've arrived at is an appropriate one and that we will revert back to sort of more normal operating, you know, after this temporary period. Right. Shall we move to the last case, probably? Very briefly, we, we, we are discussing here the possibility that we have we imagined the... Uh, uh, um, an Italian, uh, an Italian producer of luxury goods having distribution in uh, in uh, North American market and German market. Uh, of course, during the during the lockdown period, the distributors might have incurred losses and might have incurred the financial difficulties. To provide support, which Alpha is giving, the Italian producer is, is willing to give, uh, Alpha thought to, uh, is planning to, to extend a loan to, to, the, to the German subsidiary and is planning to refinance or support its uh, uh, US subsidiary through the issuance of a, of a guarantee in favor of a bank. Now the question that arises whether this support can be considered uh, for free, so meaning that no interest can be paid on the on the loan and no fee paid for the guarantees. Now trying to elaborate a little bit up front about the Italian perspective, again I would I would think that the best answer could be found in new chapter ten of the OECD guidelines. And the approach that is spelled out in this uh, by the OECD. So basically, probably the answer, uh, as you may know, the OECD has now introduced this possibility to to assess an arm length capital structure. And uh, basically, the decision should be taken based on the on the debt capacity of the borrower. So. In this respect, in, the, in our example, if we think about Beta, resident in Germany, we, we should look at the debt capacity of Beta, and if, uh, despite the deterioration in its performance, Beta still has some sort of uh, debt capacity, then, for example, my, may, you may think that Beta is a valuable, valuable asset, for example, as is the owner of shops or the key money relating to the, to the retail shops, then it might be that uh, having a debt capacity, the loan must be extended with an interest rate. At least sh this should be, could be the expectation of the Italian tax authorities. Uh, on the contrary, assuming that Beta has no debt capacity, then, and you are able to convince the tax authorities in Italy that this is the case, 
then you might charge no interest and might consider this, this uh, funding as an equity contribution. Um, I would say that uh, uh, one, one additional consideration is about uh, the fact that, uh, don't forget that despite the fact that there is this uh, monetary uh, poli uh, policies in place, uh, which, has, uh, which have driven uh, uh, interest uh, risk-free rates, base rate below the zero even, uh, this uh, situation uh, will probably, uh, I mean, just increase the, the credit spread that you will have, add, you, you will have to add to the, to the base rate because probably the deteriorated uh, performance of your subsidiary will command a, a poor credit rating, rating compared to the condition that were in place before. Having said that, um, what is important is, is, is to, to, to well document, uh, uh, to, to provide a well documented uh, um, background to, to justify your policy and the debt capacity of the borrower in, in particular. As regards the word, the guarantee, Regarding the guarantee, basically the OECD says exactly the same as for the loan. So basically, if uh, Gamma in this case, uh, uh, or at least the guarantee provided to the bank in favor of Gamma as the purpose of enabling the bank to provide the loan, so, so not improving the credit rating but allowing for the bank to provide the loan, then uh, the OECD would say, would consider that uh, Actually, the loan was not extended by the bank to, to Gamma, but by the, by the bank to Alpha. And in turn, Alpha contributed equity to Gamma. So in this case, if you are able to prove this scenario to the tax, uh, the tax authority, then uh, the interest rate uh, that, that Gamma would pay to the bank uh, would not be uh, deductible at Gamma level. Uh, and uh, and uh, there would be actually a negative contribution from alpha to gamma. So yeah, Stefano, you know, I think on the U.S. side we would look at things very similarly. Uh, you know, certainly you have know, been involved with a number of IRS audits in recent years where interest rates have been uh, the main issue. Uh, and the first step is always uh, you know, looking, examining, and critiquing uh, the credit rating analysis that was done to support uh, the interest rate. And that is, of course, I think the part that will present the biggest, uh, you know, part of interest, if you will, <clears throat> about the analysis now in trying to think about, you know, what uh, the borrowing capacity of the, the borrower is, uh, you know, given its current situation, is it, uh, you know, experiencing negative, ca or well, not negative, but severely low cash flows, uh, you know, and what is its outlook for the, the future? I think certainly the term of the loan will also be very important. If this is meant to be a very short-term bridge sort of a loan or more of a longer-term financing to keep it over, uh, you know, operating on a more long-term basis. You know, and, and, and I know Karsten will touch on the rates in a moment a little bit more, but, you know, when we think about this also, so from a U.S. perspective, we do have a safe harbor provision that is available for companies to utilize on interest rates. And it's based on what's known as the applicable federal rate. So this is a rate that's set by the U.S. Treasury. At the moment, the short-term AFR is at 0.2% approximately. So knowing that if we're thinking about having a low interest rate at least, knowing that there is an official safe harbor rate that would allow us to price it at 0.2%, you know, it's not, uh, it's not maybe a stretch to say that you know, we have some uh, other unusual circumstances that either make it, uh, you know, interest-free or to where we say, look, we're okay with 0 0.2. So maybe we don't go all the way to zero, but at 0 0.2, that's very close. And we live by this. And at least for U.S. purposes, again, you know, there is a safe harbor available there. But, Karsten, you know, I know you're thinking about uh, the, the market benchmarks for, for interest rates. It will be, Mark. Um, as, as you said, it's, it's the same in Germany. I mean, German tax authorities, um, along with the um, tax courts, they basically look at what banks would have been issued and, and what the interest rate 
would have been if they were to um, give that loans. I just um, I, wa I want to touch a little bit on 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 a court case uh, called Hornbach. Um, at least um, for the cases assuming beta and gamma were uh, located in the European Union. Um, this case goes back to 2018 and it's very simplify simplified. It says that the taxpayer, in this case alpha, it can depart from the arm's length price if it can prove um, economic reasons for doing so. And when this case um, was, was published, each of us tax practitioners thought, okay, there is no case I could think of um, where a taxpayer could pay, uh, could um, prove economic reasons that are in any case accepted, acceptable by the German tax authorities. But um, if you look at the decision, it says that um, the the um, the parent also has some sort of. Um, well, it bears a certain responsibility for financing um, non-resident companies. And I think the COVID pandemic um, nowadays could be the economic reason to justify um, um, why you grant an interest-free or a low interest loan. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, accepted by the tax authorities. They issued a, um, an ordinance in the end of 2000. Um, 18, basically saying, okay, if um, such measure, let's say an interest-free loan, was needed to keep the subsidiaries going, that would be accepted and in this case you could um, depart from an arm's length um, interest rate which would likely be um, above um, zero. But of course, that's, that's just for cases within the European Union so it doesn't work um, towards the U.S. or other third countries. Um, Ramon, would you um, add something? Would like to add something from okay, the Korean perspective? perspective. Um, well, in Korean case, we have very straightforward and specific regulation, and the Korean TP regulation clearly specify the method of calculating the arm's length price for loan and guarantee transactions respectively. And when providing loan and guarantee services, it is stated to receive the arm's length fee without exception. Uh, in Korea, tax authorities often review whether the price of the loan and guarantee transactions between overseas affiliates satisfy the arm's length principle. As a result, there were many cases leading to transport pricing taxation and litigation due to loan and guarantee transactions. Um, therefore, if in this case ARFA has provided the loan and guarantee services to its affiliates, it is Korea's regulation and practice that ARFA must receive interest fee and guarantee fee in line with the arm's length principle specified in the transport pricing regulation even in the circumstance of COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, Dan Hoon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Karsten. Thank you, everybody, for having joined uh, our, our event. Uh, we really hope that uh, you enjoyed the presentation, uh, try to, to provide different perspectives from different jurisdictions. Uh, as you all know, the OECD is currently working on these topics. An outcome is expected uh, September, October, more likely. Uh, however, we all are aware that uh, MEs probably need to, more, to move quicker compared to the OECD. So, our idea is to exactly to provide some insights and to, to try to uh, give some e input on how to react on the on the crisis and on the, on the economic crisis. Uh, and as you, as you have seen, each decision needs to be based on a, a specific analysis of the specific circumstances of the case and also taking into account uh, specific uh, specificities in each jurisdiction. For example, it's very interesting to know about safe farmers, uh, nearly zero safe farmers in, in, in the U.S. Um, of course, all your decisions that you may take today will have to be reviewed uh, in, in, somehow in some way in November, December when the OECD will, will, 
make it more clear how to behave. In the meantime, we, we thank you very much for your attendance. I thank you, my, my fellow colleagues from around the world. And uh, uh, I wish you all a nice day or a nice sleep for, for example, to Dan Thank you.